Hi all, welcome back to Sunday Seminary Online. We only have uh, this uh, class and then one more before uh, Christmas. Uh, so we're winding down our stories of uh, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, this one is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. It occurs after a story that's much more famous than it, but is short and fairly enigmatic. Second uh, Kings uh, chapter six verses one through seven is about an axe head, um, and uh, that story's been read in lots of important ways throughout history, and uh, people have really loved that story. But right after it uh, is a story that I want to focus on today. Um, I, I think it's a beautiful and amazing story. Um, it's also uh, quite often overlooked. Uh, so uh, let me let me let me, let's just jump into it. So Second Kings uh, chapter six verses eight. This story goes from chapter uh, six verse eight through uh, verse twenty four. So uh, this, it's all a unified story. It's a fascinating story in part because um, it's clearly set apart from the narratives that surround it. Um, you know, this kind of once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel in the beginning in, in uh, verse 8. Um, there's a kind of a, uh, it, it is imprecise. It's, it's, it's incredibly imprecise, in fact, um, what the, the time and place of this is. Who is this king of Syria? We've seen a few different kings of Syria um, in the book of uh, Kings so far, and there are others that will follow. Um, so is this Ben-Hadad, is this Hazael, etc. There's others. It's, it's very unclear which Aramean or Syrian king this is. And then the king of Israel is actually unnamed, um, uh, you know, in, in verse 9, for example. Uh, even the prophet who is named later, but uh, is not named at the beginning, the man of God in, chap in chapter 6, verse 10, um, uh, is, is not named. Uh, so this story kind of occurs in this um, strange kind of absence of specific times and places. Um, and then at the very end of the story, the last line says that uh, Aram and Israel didn't fight again. But then the very next story, so chapter 6, verse 25, says, well, when Aram began to fight with Israel again. So there's a very strange thing happening here in this story, which seems to be set apart in both time and place as kind of this indistinct setting. Um, but but also it, it seems like it, um, the, the narrative of the book of Kings seems to contradict that it ever happened. Which is a strange thing. Now, uh, the the authors of the biblical texts um, either were not terribly intelligent and put these stories together like this. You know, this story that says there was no more war with Israel in in, in Syria or Aram anymore, and then the very next verse saying uh, that there was in fact war with uh, Syria that started up not soon after the story. Um, uh, or there are not long after the story. Uh, you know, so that's one way of of uh, looking at this. Um, uh, I think the more convincing uh, uh, suggestion is that the the authors and editors of these stories were in fact very intelligent, knew exactly what they were doing. Um, so this story might be um, kind of prompting us to think a bit about that um, prophetic imagination that I've talked about a bit. Um, that uh, uh, Walter Brueggemann, a uh, predecessor uh, um, of mine and, and uh, my colleagues here at CTS in the Old Testament Department at Columbia Theological Seminary, uh, Walter Brueggemann um, wrote a book, this beautiful book. If you've never read it, I highly suggest it. Uh, the Prophetic Imagination just went into its uh, 40th anniversary printing recently. Um, but uh, this is kind of pointing out a, um, a way of thinking. That the, 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 the idea is that the prophets were trying to get people to think in ways that um, were not common, uh, that were different, um, that the prophets were trying to open up time and space in a way of seeing the world um, that... that that others couldn't even imagine at the time. So, so the, the pro prophet's imagination itself um, uh, was important. And so the, this story, I think I kind of, I, I see it falling into that kind of prophetic imagination um, uh, uh, kind of category um, precisely because, the, as you'll see, the story is kind of fantastical in many ways um, and is not, uh, you know, it, any anyone who is uh, who styles themselves as like a, a military historian or something would probably take great issue with this story. But even historians saying, well, the the text contradicts itself about when they fought with uh, with Aram or or Syria and so on. Um, but I don't think the story exists for that reason. If it was a historical, uh, the, the, if the point of this being in the Bible was for it to give some sort of uh, a bare bones historical fact or something, they would have more details about who the king of Syria was in this story 
when they met, what places they were at, and so on. I think the point of this is to try to give us an insight into an alternative world, um, uh, an alternative way of being. Um, so let's get into the story, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see a bit more. So once, um, when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, it's such and such a place for be my camp. And this really is kind of like a such and such a place. Poloni Almoni is what it says um, in uh, in Hebrew, um, which is also uh, this name that's used as for like Mr. So-and-so or Mr. Such-and-such um, in the book of Ruth as this person who's kind of related to Ruth or actually kind of related to Naomi um, and uh, who has kind of a responsibility for for Naomi and for Ruth's well-being, but but really doesn't doesn't help out, doesn't actually step up and 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 deal with their responsibility um, uh, and take care of Ruth and Naomi. So he's called Mister So and So and Such and Such uh, in the story of the Book of Ruth, uh, precisely to kind of write him out of the story. And here you see the same exact phrase, Poloni Almoni. Um, I'll show you here in the Hebrew, Poloni Almoni. At Such and Such is usually how it's translated in Hebrew, but it's nonsense uh, words, Poloni Almoni. Um, so at so and so a place shall be my camp. Um, so the the point being that uh, this is a, a, a king of Syria who's not named, and this place, these places, where are not named. It's a, it's in part to say that this happened again and again. So the king keeps saying, "I'm going to make my army camp here uh, for the purpose of trying to kill the king of Israel to try to destroy Israel." But verse nine, the man of God sent word to the king of Israel saying, "Don't go to this this place, that Poloni Almoni place again." This happened a lot of times, so uh, you know wherever the camp happened to be, the man of God, the Isha Elohim, the prophet Elisha, um, would uh, again not named here, um, but it's Elisha um, uh, says, uh, "Don't go there to the king of Israel." So you might think at this point that uh, the man of God, Elisha, is on the side of the king of Israel trying to destroy the Syrians. Um, that's not the case, though, um, as we'll see in a minute. But so the king of Israel uh, sent to the place about which the man of God had told him, the Poloni Almoni place. So he used to warn him, and he saved himself there more than once or twice. Um, and uh, so in Hebrew, when you say kind of more than once or twice, I mean, you're, you know, a lot of times. Uh, this this happened again and again. This was a repeated action. So um, the man of God is frustrating. Like what he's actually doing is frustrating this ambition for war. Uh, and if you look at uh, verse 8, um, that well, the king of Syria was warring. And that word is uh, nilham. He wanted to fight. Uh, he wanted to fight uh, against Israel. And uh, laham is the verb for war. Um, what is uh, fascinating here is that uh, that sounds a lot like another word that's really important um, in Hebrew, and that's uh, lechem, which means bread or food. So the word for fight and the word for food are actually um, uh, very close in Hebrew, a bit like English, food and fight. You know, people talk, you know, food fight is a thing, uh, the, the phrase, precisely because they kind of sound or and there's a little alliteration there. Um, but the, the the point is that in Hebrew, um, there are sometimes some, some kind of puns or wordplay with these, uh, but we'll see, if, just keep that that in mind, uh, lechem. Uh, and now we're getting close to Christmas now too, so Beth lechem, uh, Beit in Hebrew means, uh, or Beth means uh, a house. And lechem means bread. So Bethlehem is the house of bread, also where the bread of life was born and so on. Yeah, so uh, there's some some great uh, puns on that throughout Christian history as well. Um, but uh, in any event, so uh, the man of God is disrupting this desire for lacham, for war, uh, by frustrating uh, and making fights not happen. So... Verse 11, the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. He's in an uproar and he called his servants together. And he said, which one of you is the spy, basically? And his servants say, no one is the spy. Elisha, and here's the first name uh, really given here in this story. This guy, Elisha, this prophet, this man of God, right, who's in Israel. He tells the king the words that you speak in your in your private chamber, in your bedroom, you know, but in your most private chambers. Um, so in other words, uh, Elisha just knows, right? Of course, he knows from God but he's seen as the problem here. So the king says, okay, uh, go get him, right? Let's kill this guy because I want to kill the king of Israel, but really first I got to go kill this other guy uh, who's stopping me from killing the king of Israel. So let's, let's kill him. And it was told to him, behold, he's in Dothan. So this little town in Alabama, Dothan, Al no, uh, it's really, but uh, you know, it's uh, uh, this this town in Israel, uh, Dothan, Dothan, Alabama is named after Dothan, Israel. Uh, but uh, but so Dothan uh, or Dothan uh, is uh, a, a small city, um, a small town uh, that, uh, you know, doesn't, it wouldn't have been a match for the king of Aram or Syria. Um, the, one of the largest armies in the, the in the region. So the king of Aram sends all these horses and chariots and a great army, and they surround the city at night. You know, think about it in like the modern era, you know, tanks and 
you know, uh, fighter jets and stuff. So the servant of the man of God wakes up. So we cut scene, right? So at night they, they kind of, cr they're crouching. Imagine this whole army arrayed around this little town. In the morning, the servant of the man of God, this kind of young kid, gets up and he's going out to like wash stuff and get get ready for the morning, right? Uh, and he gets up and he goes out and he sees the he, like the army surrounding the city as the sun's coming up, right? And revealing their position. So he freaks out and he says, alas, my master, what should we do? When someone says alas in the Bible, they mean I'm going to die. We're going to die. Um, so this is kind of like a woe is us, right? Um, we are, we are uh, I, I am foretelling our death. What are we going to do? Is there anything we can do, uh, you might think. Um, so then Elisha answers him. You imagine Elisha wakes up and says, do not be afraid, which is how oracles of salvation begin. So he starts out by saying, you don't have to be scared right now. Uh, God's going to help us. Uh, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And, you know, our army's bigger than theirs. And so the kid must have looked around and been like, mm, no, there's like 100 people in this town and there's a 1,000 soldiers surrounding us, right, um, with chariots and, you know, sort of military technology that, that um, is would crush anything we have on our side, right? Uh, and then Elisha prayed and said, oh, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So this, this idea of like opening the eyes, this is really fascinating. And that really is the verb for open, you know, open his eyes. Um, the boy has seen, right? He, he, he has opened his eyes. He woke up, opened his eyes and, and saw the army. Um, but what's being pointed out here, this is a pun that happens um, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that there's something more to sight than what we see with our eyes. Um, that there are sometimes uh, truths about the world that we can't see, uh, we can't perceive um, with our normal modes of perception. We have to see deeper, see differently. Um, some people call it, you know, spiritual eyes of sight, um, but also just kind of insight sometimes, right? You know, to see what's true in ourselves or true in the world that, that one can't really see very clearly with all the blinders we have on and, you know, the kind of the, the filters we have, the lenses that we have that uh, show us the world uh, the way that we perceive it, um, which oftentimes we overlook certain things. We, you know, we're programmed to see the world in a certain way. And so Elisha asks that this, that this boy open up his, his, his true eyes, right, uh, and, and really see the world in front of him. Um, and so God opened the eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Remember those chariots of fire from chapter 2 of Second Kings? when Elisha was taken up in the, Elijah was taken up in heaven and Elisha witnessed this, right? Those chariots of fire were kind of like the armies um, of God. Uh, you know, the Lord of hosts um, is a term that's referred, that used to refer to, to Yahweh sometimes. Um, that doesn't mean hosting like setting out a nice dinner spread. It means hosting as in uh, the host, the army, right? The host is coming, right? The, the armies are coming. So it's just a, an ancient word for armies uh, in English too. Uh, but uh, but this word um, uh, Sabaot in uh, or Sabaot, if you've like sung that hymn, you know, Lord Sabaot, his name. That's the Hebrew word that means the armies, the hosts. Uh, so when uh, so, so this boy can see that there's actually more heavenly soldiers around, you know, angelic or whatever, you know, divine uh, soldiers around, and they're kind of made of this fire that can't usually be seen by human eyes. So when the Syrians come down against him, so then, like, you know, at this moment, uh, the, the Syrian army is surrounding them, and they don't know, you know, they, they, they don't know that there's, they, they can't see the army of fire either. Uh, they're like the boy. So uh, they start to kind of, like, come down the mountain. Above them is kind of the chariots of fire, it seems. Um, so the chariots of fire are kind of behind them, maybe, because I mean, it says he looked up and he saw them. But in any event... However, the scene is set. Um, there are different interpreters that that, that kind of uh, imagine this scene in different ways. However, this works. Elisha, at this point where they're about to die, right? The soldiers are ch charging down at them in their chariots and shooting arrows and so on. And Elisha prays to God and says, "Please strike this people." And that word in Hebrew, "strike," or is the word for smite, um, is sometimes translated. Um, that that's a word that means destroy, smash, kill. Um, it's it, it's a word of uh, kind of um, uh, crushing, uh, destroying. Uh, when God smites Pharaoh, you know this is the kind of word that means, right? Uh, to punch, to to strike, uh, with in violence, um, and it usually involves death. Um, so when uh, when Elisha says, "Please strike this people," I mean, you know, the, if you think about it from the position of the king of Aram or Syria, uh, this king sees the Israelites as a problem, and if only they would be destroyed, if they could be just destroyed they could be wiped off the face of the earth then everything would be better right then everything would be fine that's what the king wants 
king of Israel wants to eradicate the king of Aram, right? If they could just get rid of them, everything would be fine, right? Uh, so Elisha seems to kind of ask in that way, you know, is, is he on the side of, of Israel, of, of the king of Israel? Um, you know, Elisha says, please strike this people. But then he says, with blindness. And it's, that's, the translation is blindness. The word is sanvarim in, uh, in, in Hebrew. And that's a very strange word. It's not the typical word used um, to refer to someone who does not have the ability to see with their eyes, right? The uh, kind of physical sight. Um, so the, the disability of blindness is not actually what's referred to by this word, um, in part because it's only used twice in the Bible. We don't know exactly what this means, but the, the root has something to do with light, a bright light. Um, and the only other time it, this word really occurs to refer to people as in like a condition of some, some kind of blindness um, is in Genesis. It's in uh, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So in that narrative of the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, in Genesis 19, um, the people of the town are trying to kind of, uh, uh, you know, hurt the, the people inside the building and Lot's guests, which, which are really angels, but they don't know this. Um, they're struck with blindness, but it's it's the same word, sanvarim. And they're not really blind exactly. It seems they're confused. It's like a confusion. It's like a big bright light that confuses them. So they're able to see. They're just not able to understand. Uh, like they couldn't find the doorknob is, is what happened in Genesis 19 when they're trying to break into the house, but they like kind of... Can't, can't see as straight or something, um, but uh, or maybe can't can't act on what they want to do. Anyway, it's just they're struck with kind of a confusing brightness. Uh, so this is this is what he asked. You know, please crush these people with light. Uh, and so God did this. God struck the people with this kind of disorienting light uh, in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. So God did what Elisha asked to do. Uh, so again, you know, this kind of makes you like kind of get in the edge of the seat. Whoa, is God going to destroy all these, you know? No, God's just going to kind of confuse them for a moment. And then Elisha says to them this thing that sounds a bit like the kind of Jedi mind trick. Uh, this is not the way. This is not the city. I love it because uh, the word way um, in Hebrew is uh, derek, and this can mean like an actual physical road, like a path, a way that you walk, or it can mean like a way that you live your life. This is, you know, there's a similar metaphor in English about like kind of walk the way, right? Um, uh, I walk the line, right? You know, I mean, so you're actually walking a line, but then also you're kind of that means your, your morality is sticking to a certain straight and narrow, right? You know, so uh, this the same kind of metaphor exists in in, in Hebrew. Uh, the way of the Lord, uh, you know, or something like that, or like, you know, walk in the way of, of God. Um, so this is not the way. So that's true on a literal level. This is not actually the way. They're looking to get to Samaria. They want to destroy some, the king of Israel in Samaria. They want to destroy the, the, the headquarters of the Israelite armies, right? And that's in Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. It's not, it's not uh, in Dothan, right? This little tiny town, right? This is not the way. But also, this is not the way, maybe trying to crush your opponent is not the way to get what you want, what you really want, which is not just destroying the other. The, what you really want is a good life, peace, love, joy, happiness, right? And this is not the way. And then this is not the city, right? This is the this is the wrong city, right? Uh, what you're really looking for is Samaria. Like, Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. Not me, right? I mean, you seek me because you want to kill me so that you can get to the real guy. I'll just take you to the real guy, the guy you wanted in the first place, the king of Israel. And he led them to Samaria and led them. Like, I mean, he like, you can, you know, he held their hands. I mean, they're disoriented, you know, he's like leading them. Like, I mean, imagine like, you know, see kindergartners at the museum, you know, they hold hands with one another and walk through the hallways. You know, I mean, you know, this, they're holding hands, walking through Israel, you know, I mean, so he's taking them all the way to Samaria. And as soon as they entered Samaria, so they like walk through the front door of the, the gate of the city, you know, how'd they get in? Who knows? But, uh, you know, they want, they just walk right in the front door of the city. And uh, at that moment, Elisha says, oh Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And again, they can see sort of before that, but now they're going to really see. Um, so God opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. They're in the city of Samaria. This is where they wanted to be the whole time, to kill the king of Israel, right? They wanted to break into the walls of Samaria. I mean, these armies would besiege cities for years at a time sometimes to be able to get into the city walls. And Elisha just brings them right through. You know, how exactly? We don't know, but Elisha's got these powers, right? He can do this kind of thing. Um, so right now you got these two armies kind of staring each other face in the face, you know, and and what are they going to do, right? So they, they, they're they probably amazed, scared, 
surprised. And as soon as the king of Israel saw them, you can imagine the king of Israel wakes up in the morning, looks out his window, and, what is this? You know, and he walks out there and he sees his enemy, the enemy army, but they're like in, they're disoriented in the middle of his city. And he says to Elisha, my father, this is kind of like, you know, sign of uh, respect, right? Shall I strike them down? Shall I start? Really, he's saying, shall I kill them? Can I, can I kill them? Can I kill them? He repeats it twice, kind of like a little kid. He's like so excited. Can I please kill them? Can I please kill them? Right? That would end this. That would end this once and for all. Just like the Arameans want to end it by killing us. We, you know, it's it, there can only be one, right? I mean, one of us has got to die. One of us has got to live, right? Aram and Israel are mortal enemies. That's what we think, right? Can I kill them and end this all? And then Elisha answers him, no, you can't strike them down. He, he, he literally says, you, you cannot strike them down. Did you strike down? Would you like? Would you even try to kill those wh whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Like, did you take these people captive? If, if you didn't take them captive, then why are you even asking to try to hurt them, right? To kill them? They're not your captives. That's that's what Elisha is saying here. The, the, this is this is not your handiwork here. You don't get to make decisions about other people's. Uh, captives, and in fact, they're not captives. I didn't ca make them captives. I brought, I led them here, right? So, and then he says, um, set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master, that is the king of Aram. Like, th they're not here for you to kill them. They're here because they're hungry and you need to feed them. Uh, it's an amazing move, but also uh, this word right here, bread, set bread and water before them. That's the word lechem. Remember I said at the beginning of this, that word nilcham, that verb nilcham or lacham, um, that, that means to fight, uh, to fight in war. Um, so the king of Aram was trying to fight Israel in war, and Elisha kept frustrating that. And at the very end of the story, Israel wants to destroy the soldiers of Aram. And instead of saying, yes, kill them, destroy them, fight them, lacham them, uh, instead, he says, no, you're supposed to give them lechem, bread, food. Uh, this is this is kind of a, a, you know, bread, not bombs kind of thing, you know. Uh, I, I, the, you're, you're looking at these guys thinking you want to kill them, but in fact, these are your guests. Is that the way you would talk to your guest? Is that the way you treat your guests? No, give them bread and water there hot basic hospitality what's amazing is that uh this is also by the way kind of one of the th this is the basic idea of the sodom and gomorrah story which shares this word sonverine this word for blindness but really kind of disorientation by light a lot of people think sodom and gomorrah is about sex it's not about sex it's about hospitality people show up in a town where they don't belong the, the two angels right but they show up that, that people know that they look like people they show up in a town uh they're looking for lot right and people try to take advantage of them and hurt them and, and, and injure them um it happens to involve sex the kind of abuse that these people wanted to, to deal out um to the two angels that are there but at the same time it's not about sex it's about when people show up, vulnerable people show up in your community, what do you do to them? Do you, t do you hurt them and try to take advantage of them and use them for your own pleasure? Or do you help them? Because the story that comes right before the story of Sodom and Gomorrah are the three angels showing up to Abram. And Abraham gets up and feeds them, gives them what they need, gives them hospitality, gives them food and water. This is the contrast. Now, how do I also know that that's the main point of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Because in Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, uh, uh, it says in Ezekiel chapter 16, it says, this is the sin of, of, uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the, their sin was that they didn't have hospitality uh, that they gave to their guests. They didn't give to those um, who were vulnerable and who came to them. So, so that's this ties in, right? This, uh, you know, Elisha says the, these are vulnerable people in your midst. They may be your mortal enemies, and they may want to kill you, and you may want to kill them. But right now, they're disoriented, and they're far from home, and they're hungry, and they're tired, and they're thirsty. They just came from a long journey. You need to give them food and water and rest, and then send them back home. So the king then prepared for for them a great feast the king starts cooking puts on the apron right makes a great feast for them and after the army this invading army of arameans had eaten and drunk he sent them away to their homes instead of killing them and they went to their master that is the king and then it says and the syrians did not come again on raids to the land of israel it's 
kind of a beautiful end to that story, right? Uh, this idea um, that there is, uh, that meals can heal, that meals can overcome boundaries and violence and anger, that hospitality can heal wounds, right? That, uh, that This is all amazing and beautiful. It also ties so well into the Christian message, uh, into the message of Jesus in the Gospels, right? Where uh, giving hospitality, giving food, welcoming people, but also uh, this idea that uh, the breaking of the bread, right? That there will be this feast, this this Eucharistic reconciliation feast someday, right? Um, that this is kind of a foreshadowing of that, of that, of that great feast that one day um, from people from north, south, east, and west uh, that will be united. Um, so this, uh, you know, this this image it's to me a beautiful image um, uh, of of the possibility um, of overcoming uh, these divisions and boundaries and hatred. Uh, uh, there's also um, a kind of a jarring shift, uh, the beginning of the next story, verse 24. Afterwards, Ben-Hadad, now he's named, the king of Syria is named, but the king of Syria wasn't named in the previous story. Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army, went up and besieged Samaria. So then we have this long, uh, difficult story, honestly, about... Um, uh, about uh, a besieging of uh, of the city of Samaria, but also that has this amazing moment of lepers um, that find this amazing feast laid out for them, and they decide to share it um, instead of hoard it off themselves. I mean, it's amazing on several different levels. So, in any event, there's a there's a lot in these uh, a few stories about food and the sharing of food. This is ties into the larger message, right, all the way back to First Kings 17 with Elijah, um, that. God's provision um, can do miraculous things, and uh, also that God is looking after, especially the vulnerable um, uh, people like the widow of Zarephath. Um, we're going to return next week um, uh, to this story of uh, kind of a vulnerable person um, for whom there is a connection to the land and to food. Um, uh, and, and Elisha is able to bring about a miraculous uh, recovery of something that went missing. Um, but that's that last verse there, that the king of Syria now just goes and fights, fights Samaria. Um, you know, it's jarring, verses 23 to 24. Like I said, I don't think the authors of the Bible and the editors of the Bible were stupid. I don't think they made a mistake here. I think they were setting this story about what's possible um, in the midst of a story about... Um, about the realities of the world, about what happened. Um, this, we're only one step away from the other one being true. Which one's true and which one's, you know, kind of reality. Um, we're always really close to it um, uh, at any moment, right? Um, we could live in that other world. Uh, there are some certain things that keep, that keep us from, from doing that. Uh, but they don't always have to. All right, next week uh, we're going to get to the, uh, the the amazing story of the Shunammite woman, that uh, kind of the reprise uh, of this. Uh, but then I'll also do just kind of a brief um, summary of the Elijah and Elisha stories and and talk about the last couple of times that uh, that that Elisha shows up after uh, chapter 8. Um, so it's been an incredible semester so far. Um, I've been having a really fun time talking through these stories. I hope it's been helpful for you all. Uh, and uh, we'll be thinking about topics for the next class. So if you've got some, send them my way. See you all.